afternoon. Thank you for having us. This is such an honor and a privilege to come and speak with all of you. It's very exciting. So we are sisters. I'm Erica Thale and um, my sister Alita Host is right next to me. We're having some audio issues, but we'll work through it. So I'll only have mine on when she is speaking. Um, but yes, we're sisters and we both uh, co-own Salish Grounds and it's been a labor of love. We have had our company for the last five years and really our Genesis story, it, I'm sure, is like many of um, many of anybody who's an entrepreneur. Um, sorry, I sound one moment. So we, we developed this idea about 15 years ago and it's taken us, um, many sittings and it, drinking coffee and enjoying a uh, conversation to fully develop our idea to where finally we were just at a point where we decided this is it, the time is now, we need to get a move on this. And we looked at all of the data and analytics surrounding coffee, and it is a very saturated market. And it's um, one that is dominated by many corporations. And one of the biggest corporations is here in Washington, which truly is traditionally Salish uh, area. And so when we were developing this idea, we realized that it needs to be a labor of love. It's something that we are both emotionally, mentally uh, invested in, and that we always keep at the forefront our vision and our meaning and um, really thinking about the end in, in what we want to achieve in terms of our business. So we grew up here on the Salish waters in um, Thurston and Mason County. We grew up in a fishing community where both of our parents were treaty fisher, fishermen and women. And we grew up on the boats fishing in from August to December with our family. And during that time, we would always look forward to having coffee, even as a, even as young girls, we would uh, be on the boat, it would be cold, it would be rough and stormy. And just the smell of coffee was peaceful. It meant that times were good, that our parents had achieved what they needed to achieve to provide for our family. And so that has always been with us. And when we we're factoring in, breaking into that market, those were one of our drivers that this is something that we've always loved and that we, we've always wanted to do. So we developed the idea because we are from this area and we have come up with two different blends, one being Longhouse, which is to highlight the family dynamics um, from our, not only our community, but we as Erica and Alita hold very dear that our families traditionally gathered in longhouses and we wanted to really encapsulate that idea and that acknowledgement to who we are and to our community and our history as Native women. Additionally, our um, black fit, Blackfish blend is is paying respect to um, to the waters of our traditional territories. And really, we are from what's called the Christ family within Squaxin Island. And the killer whale is one of our our guides or something that we use as a sim symbolism to stay on the right path, to stay on the right journey. And so it's really a acknowledgement to that. So we started out small and sort of the, the little company that could, but it's really been our vision and the, 
the intrinsic meaning of our company that has kept us going. And we have really grown from year one to year five. We've had exponential growth in terms of what moving product and creating relationships among other tribes and tribal organizations and and really investing back into our native economy. So I'll hand it over to Alina. Good afternoon, everybody. Did you turn this on? Oh, oh yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. Oops, sorry. Yeah. We're adjusting mics over here. <laughs> um, thank you for that introduction, Erica. And yeah, as Erica had mentioned, like we had very humble beginnings um, sitting around at a table and talking about what you know what does it mean to be an entrepreneur like what does that look like and we knew from growing up with our mom and hearing her stories of growing up with her parents and her grandparents that that is a spirit that has um remained really strong within our lineage especially in the women we descend from a long line of entrepreneurs um um a long line of women who have been entrepreneurs in their own right. And um, so we wanted to really honor that and recognize it and use this opportunity that we have today to um, not only highlight our culture, but to bring true representation to the table. And the, um, you know, having this idea was something that was like so... Um, integral for us because it was um, an opportunity for us to just like really show that this legacy that we can build we can build on this legacy that our parents and grandparents had laid before us um, excuse me and so when we talk about authenticity it's not just a, a marketing tactic for us it's not an area for us that we're um, just trying to improve a bottom line or that we're trying to see a profit. For us, it really means tapping into the ancestral wisdom of having a seat at the table when it comes to um, having discussions about um, business, about the economy. For us, when um, we first started having these conversations, we started talking about the extractive relationships that tribes have with vendors. And we knew that we could improve that and that we could make it better, that um, we had a stronger sense of what reciprocity means in terms of um, developing a stronger economy. And we had um, a lot of resources to glean off of. Um, our uh, mom, she, you know, growing up, she hung net as part of her, as part of her living. She would, um, you know, meet with various fishermen throughout the community and she would take their nets and hang them. And that was her source of income. Everybody knew our mother as mm -hmm. one of the best um, net hangers from here, from on the uh, Western Washington side. And so we grew up watching her, you know, have her own business in that sense. Our um, grandmother and our great grandmother um, we go further down the line and we descend from a woman called, her name was Swissalo. Swissalo was one of the very first oyster farmers here in the Olympia area. She grew and uh, maintained uh, Olympia oyster beds um, near what is present day Steamboat Island. And she taught a lot of um, the first pioneers how to farm those oyster beds. And they developed their business practices off of her knowledge. And so when we started this um, when as we like started to grow with our business, we really wanted to bring those elements into it. And so, as Erica mentioned, we've had a slow growth. Um, we haven't, you know, um, we we didn't like come out guns blazing. Like we wanted to take our time and make every every step we took and every action we took was very intentional. And so we have a very um, you know, kind of set practice and process that we went through in determining how we were going to source our beans, the partners that we were going to work with to source those beans, and to ensure that we were also doing our due diligence to protect that proprietary information and um, ensuring that, you know, but that, that we're doing it in a way that 
um, aligns with our ethics and our values because we know what it looks like to come from a community that has been overexploited. And so the coffee business is one of those, you know, industries that tends to um, exploit the, the farmers. And we wanted to ensure that we weren't contributing to that. And so it took us um, probably the first year and a half um, before we actually were able to nail down and um, find the right partner for us. And um, since then, like we we have just decided to maintain with the um, three blends that we have. And we're continuously um, having conversations and monitoring what that looks like and how we're going to grow. Um, and we have several different partners throughout Washington um, that currently sell our coffee. And so, um, you know, we, um, a few of those are in Seattle. There's a few local areas here in Olympia, but we do try to be very um, cautious and mindful of like how that, how that story is being told and, you know, how we're contributing back to this, um, this larger system. <clears throat> And it, it's really starting with that why, that why, that that reason why we wanted to do that. And like Alita mentioned, having that why deeply ingrained with us and really calling upon those, um, we call it ancestral wisdom in our, our culture and calling upon that within us as women, Native women, squawks and women, it it's that driving force that really gets us through those hard times, that that daily grind that happens when you are a business owner. And it's really that that beacon of hope that we realize that we had really strong uh, women go before us and really lay that foundation for us to be successful. And so we are going to have a seat at this table in the coffee industry. And it it really is that that element that keeps us going when the rubber meets the road, because as you all know, it is really tough and taxing at times to be a business owner and to keep going and to um, keep that 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 momentum consistent and keep your discipline in line. So having that shared legacy and having that 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 continuous um, drive to build towards our mission and keeping our past in mind is crucial for addressing the struggles. And um, in talking about struggles, just as every entrepreneur, we have had our definite highs and our, our definite lows. And as we mentioned, we have been in this industry now for five years, and it's been quite the roller coaster from figuring out all of the administrative paperwork, uh, figuring out logistics, sourcing, pricing, and navigating just the overall competitive market and nature of the coffee business. So we we have committed to navigating all those struggles that arise by staying not only in alignment as sisters, but as business partners and being very transparent with each other when we are getting burnt out, um, or overwhelmed, or we want to bounce ideas off of each other because we both do have full-time jobs. We have families. Alita has little, little kids, and it is a, a challenge at times. So making sure that we have that consistency is key at navigating um, even opportunities that come up. Yeah switcheroo here um and you know one of those things too is like really for us like we've we've had to deal with some of those like our own like mental like uh blocks or mental challenges and dealing with some imposter syndrome feeling like you know we don't belong in this market like we don't you know belong here and what does that mean and you know it's nice to be able to have 
a partner to discuss that and to like really hold each other up. And um, even more, I think having a community of support, you know, a community of support. We have so many people from our tribe and other tribes who have just reached out and really held us up in those moments where we're like, we're, we're, you know, we're questioning, like, do we continue this? Do we, you know, keep moving forward? Are we making the right decisions? And, um, you know, I think that in itself has been also one of our strengths as, um, you know, as entrepreneurs is being able to recognize that we're, we have our own vulnerabilities, um, but not allowing those vulnerabilities to um, be debilitating for us. And so, you know, just having that, that um, perseverance and that grit to be able to move forward um, beyond those obstacles is, um, it's, you know, even if like we, we've talked about this, like even if we decided one day we're not going to move forward with Salish Grounds, like we've developed so much, you know, we've learned so much as individuals, as professionals, and, you know, we have such a vast understanding now of what it means to start from the very humble beginnings, from starting from the ground, the ground up. And, um, you know, we do hope that, you know, we can, can, we do continue to grow because this is something that we would um, like to pass on to our children and to, um, you know, continue to bring on other Indigenous artists and, you know, just continue to support the, um, this, you know, this larger population and to really recognize and hold true to what it means to be a, a Salish person in this market. And um, yeah, just... The mental dexterity and having grit piece, I'm sure as many uh, of you all have identified, if you've approached a business idea or um, are in the midst of being a business owner, um, some of the criticism that comes from individuals or the offhanded remarks that we faced as well, um, things from, oh, that's, that's a cute idea to things like you're never going to do it. Why would you ever do something that's in a highly saturated market? Um, and so having that mental dexterity has been crucial for us. And again, we always have that why, that reason, that that vision to get us through the criticism, to get us through the self-doubt. And um, Alita, for me, she's my little sister, but she's somebody I always look for look towards because she just continues. She never stops. She might get tired, but she will never stop. She'll give herself a break, but she'll pick back up and really follow through. And so it's been very inspirational to work next to her and, and just keep that momentum going. And, um, knowing that when we're, we're at a place where we're mentally, we need a break to say, hey, I need you as my partner, as my business partner to pick up this slack here and to follow through on X, Y, and Z um, vendors that have reached out or something along those lines. But identifying and, and taking mental note of committing to that grit and you and um, having that flexibility um, mentally in a changing market, in a changing world, in a changing economy is, is crucial. And, um, you, you read about that really in every successful entrepreneur that having that ability to just keep going really is the true marker of success and why some people end up breaking out of it where others sort of fall to the wayside. It's committing to finishing the race, to committing to moving the needle forward. And that's where we're at is always looking at, we're tired, we're going to keep going. Maybe not today, but definitely tomorrow or within the next week. So that's crucial as, as being a business owner. 
And some of the other things that we've found success with is differentiating our business model towards that authenticity. And Alita really hit on hit it on the head earlier with that authenticity really is the emotional heartbeat of our brand. And I'm sure as many of you know, that brand is always evolving, always morphing and changing, but at, at our root, at our core, who we are, what we're doing, and having, again, that why, that, that driver, that intrinsic driver is the heartbeat of what keeps us going, that propels us forward, and that we get to share a story and we get to communicate we get to bridge the story and the brand and have our, not only us represented, but also have other indigenous communities represented in this space, which is, is crucial, is crucial for us as indigenous people to, again, have a seat at that table, especially since this is our ancest ancestral gra grounds. We want to um, we want to approach it with an effort of decolonizing that space and really getting back to um, those drivers and who we are as as tribal people to propel these values that we have as being business owners forward. And so just, you know, um, kind of wrapping up that conversation and um, really talking about what, you know, that, that kind of resiliency that we've had to have. And, um, you know, we, we definitely have, have our moments, but we also know that like, we have such a vast network of support and this deep well of knowledge that we can pull from and knowing that, you know, our people, like as squawks and people that we have um, had to be resilient. We have had to adapt to changing times. And um, we know that we come from a people that have had a strong economy in this area. And that wasn't just here in Washington, but our um, trade routes, our um, economy routes, and these aren't just trails that we're talking about. These are the 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 roadways that you know where I five is today, where some of the highways are. Those were our roads. That's how we communicated. That's how we transported our goods. This is how this was our commerce system. And um, you hear you may have heard at other times that the waterways were also our roadways. And so our people were trading for you know, hundreds of thousands of years pre-contact with um, European settlers. And so for us, we know that there has been this, this changing of times where we've had, where our people have had to adapt to that. And so um, that's such a crucial, like, um, skill set to have as an entrepreneur, because things are constantly changing in the world, in the economy. You have to stay up to date with what's happening in your, your, your systems. And, um, you know, I think just having that, you know, the, a, a strong business partner is so essential because, you know, if you're going at this alone, it can be really challenging, you know, to like, just pull yourself up sometimes some days and um you know so having a person to yeah have that hand that's like hey you know it's okay we got this we have this we're moving forward and you're gonna have to pivot or you have to let go of this idea and um there's been times where yeah that's the hardest part sometimes is letting go of like this this idea that you want to hold so strongly onto and you keep trying to wedge it into this system and it it's like no it doesn't work you have to let this one go and so um just having you know that um resilience and strength to be able to like support one another And, and so we um, have really made an effort to have an emphasis on maintaining that resiliency while also having collective growth. 
and it is our goal to continue to partner with other indigenous vendors and establishments to um, that have our shared values, that have our shared goals, and continue continue to feed into that indigenous economy. And as Alita says, having that reciprocity is is so important to us. And so we are selective and we are very cautious and careful um, on who we do business with. And um, we really think and, and feel that that contributes to our overall business model in ensuring that we, we're, we are doing the right thing when we have this this business that is in a saturated market that we get to um, we just get this opportunity to to really highlight uh, other artists other business other tribal businesses other um, tribal events that are crucial to um, to growing not only our business but their their businesses as well and so um, that's really how we'll approach it. We have a fact sheet that we'll check and sit down with each other that will make sure that they have shared not only the business, but shared goals, shared values, and um, what are they doing within their specific communities as well. So as we, you know, continue to have these conversations and like Erica and I have, um, you know, some planning sessions and um, just really like in-depth conversations about what are going to be our next steps. And recently, you know, some, some of the things that we've been talking about is really, you know, trying to put some, um, our feet down, so to say, here in the Olympia excuse me, here in the Olympia area, um, we will be, you know, in the next year or so, we're looking to um, get a storefront open, a um, place that we can really start bringing people in and hosting um, and having this, like this coffee shop, this um, cafe that also serves as a, as a source that we can highlight some of the indigenous wealth of this area. We have so many cousins and relatives who make beautiful, um, intricate designs of clothing and jewelry in different areas. And when you go into Olympia, you don't see that represented. There isn't a store, there isn't a hub, there isn't a place, there isn't any sort of collective that you can go to and you can see um, squawks and representation, Salish representation. And so for us, this idea of having a coffee, um, you know, it's not just a shop, but like the, a collective is, um, is, is broader. And so, um, you know, be on the lookout and, um, you know, just be aware that like we have next steps, um, coming down, coming down the line. And we hope, you know, to have further conversations with, um, different partnerships and, um, yeah. And it looks like Erica's uh, computer died. So <laughs> we're going to share here. <laughs> it died. Sorry. <laughs> um, and just our, our closing statement that we are always growing, learning, adapting. One area that we, we realize is a deficit for us is our, our marketing and really getting out and utilizing platforms, um, social media platforms and those sort of things. So in addition to our overall goal and creating a collective space for other indigenous um, people is to really hunker down and get get a, a better plan for our marketing efforts. And, and I will say that being, you know, Erica and I, we're both very introverted people that it's difficult for us at times to put ourselves out there. And so the marketing aspect has been a challenge for us because neither one of us wants to put our face out there or like, um, there, you know, there's times that we're just like, Ooh, that's, that's like a, it, an area that like, we just need to, um, step outside of our own comfort zone mm -hmm. and, um, really, you know, get out there and push, push our product, push our idea and our brand. And so, um, 
yeah that's mm -hmm. <laughs> it is do we want to if anybody has any questions i think mm -hmm. um now would be a good time I have one as people are sort of thinking through. Um, can you talk about, you know, in particular, the impacts that COVID had on your business, but also the impacts that you saw COVID having on the local economic system, not only in sort of the tribe, <laughs> excuse me, your own tribe, but also um, other sort of local tribal communities as well? That is a great question. Definitely. We, yeah, as we said, we've been in business for five years, but it really feels like three years because um, as a small business, it, it was extremely hard to work in COVID. So we were fortunate enough to where we could sort of pause operations and just wait. We had a few vendors, but it was very, very minimal but those vendors were struggling and it impacted them severely. And luckily we have a lot of um, individuals who are extremely resilient and creative and they were able to rely on that creativity to really pull themselves out of that COVID slump. And so it has hit um, not only our small community um, and network of of businesses, it's you can see the ripple effect of the the post COVID economy travel through through the entirety of of the coffee industry itself. Thank you. I have a follow up that's not directly related to sort of COVID, but um, I wonder as business owners what resources you have found particularly valuable. Um, throughout this this process, mm -hmm. um, a few of those resources. So the SBA, the Small Business Administration, has been crucial. They have really served as like this this guiding point for us, and um, just a you know like when we've had questions of like especially around like the taxes and like filing with the state um they have been so helpful in answering all of those questions and helping us to navigate that sending us documents that give us kind of like a step by step and tutorials um mm -hmm. and i think without that support we would have been lost mm -hmm. um you know there, there's so so many little mm -hmm. things that go on, into the back end of a business that we were unaware of mm -hmm. and um then the there was also a organization um the shahalis tribe had hosted a small business um it was like a small business conference and they brought in a, a specialist who was helping to um, develop business plans. And so we were able to connect with them, you know, through um, their tribe and they were, um, they had their arms open to us, even though we weren't Shehala's tribal members and they allowed us to attend the this conference and they helped us develop our business plan and get, kind of get things going. And then um, just having some local resources of um, just individual community members that we knew for doing some of the, um, you know, kind of photos and stuff. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It looked like there was a few questions in the chat. What do you use as scheduling planning software? Monday.com right now we're we're always trying different apps and sort of integrations with each other just because we are on very different schedules and um yeah we we've tried everything from Monday to Google um <clears throat> Gmail texting <laughs> but um Monday really keeps those plans in check and a centralized location to where we can really see where where each other's at if we haven't connected in a while
as a follow-up, um, what are some of your other favorite apps or technology that you've used with your business? Maybe not for scheduling, but for point of sale or marketing or something related? Yeah. Um, so we currently use like Equid, um, QuickBooks, and um, uh, those two are integrated really well together. We've used Square. Um, there are some like higher charges with like Squarespace, um, but Equid has been like like a lifesaver because they help manage the, our storefronts on our website. And then through that system, like we can um, just create automatic shipping labels and um, get it sent off. And then it helps with um, keeping track of all of the analytics, how many people have been stopping by the store and um, reminding people like, hey, you forgot something in your cart. And so um, that has been a great tool for us. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I've got a, a bajillion questions. Um, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, I'm curious if you could talk more about <clears throat> what is drawing you. You spoke about, um, you know, your future plans at Olympia and this idea. I'm so sorry. Give me a second. Yeah. So just, I should just type my questions in the chat. Um, <laughs> and uh, your hope to open a collective. Um, and I'm wondering um, where that came from? Um, and if you were drawing inspiration from any examples in particular that you found that you're like, that that sounds really cool. Yeah, yeah. I, I think like naturally, so within our community, you know, there's always, there, there has always been these like little bazaars. Well, growing yeah. up, there used to be this Christmas bazaar where all of the aunties would like come out with like all of their fun, like Christmas lays or um, candy lays and, you know, Christmas decorations and just different like homemade goods. And over the years, um, you know, we had always talked about that, about yeah. like how fun it was to be able to ha have those handmade gifts from people within our community. Mm -hmm. And then also just knowing that like, there's times that we want to support our local artists, our local indigenous artists. And it's there, it can be kind of challenging to navigate that sometimes because there isn't like a central location that you can go to pick up and support a, a tribal artist. We have cousins who are phenomenal drum makers and they kind of you know have their own system of like letting people know that they have some uh you know some art artwork or um drums available but for us when we think about that about having this business like it's not just Erica and I like we really do want that legacy to carry on for our community too because it's just like this community has helped support us and has mm -hmm. helped lift us up that we you know when we talk about reciprocity that's what it means it's also providing a space for others who may not want a full-blown store but they want a space to sell their product mm -hmm. And it really ties back to uh, the longhouse, our longhouse blend. That is the, it sort of encompasses who we are. Also just, we are family people. We are people oriented. Although like Lita said, we're, we're introverted. We still like to surround ourselves with others. And, and um, that's where you get your ideas. That's where you get your you know, meeting with your family, catching up with people and kind of going back to the COVID question, we are really missing that just as a society as whole, having those community spaces, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, again, and interacting with each other. Um, you know, the Zoom is nice, but it would be great to see everybody's faces and look at the body language and see how, mm -hmm. how you're responding. But I really, as far as we we go and not only as tribal people but just as mothers and women that element is of having a space where people can come together is is lacking not only in our area but as as society as a whole and honestly long houses i think that's why our people were so strong and carry such strong familial ties is because we grew, we historically grew up in longhouses where those stories were shared, um, where family weighed in on how you were doing. And we definitely have that with all of our relatives.
There's one question in the chat. Uh, what's your most popular menu item? Our blackfish. Mm -hmm. So the blackfish is our like um, espresso blend. It's this dark chocolatey, like flavored coffee. And it is definitely like our number one. Mm -hmm. um, well, I would... I, Actually, I take that back. It may be number one outside of tribal community because within our tribal community, we have our longhouse and the um, a lot of our like tribal members and like their tribal businesses prefer the longhouse. And I can't say if that we've collected enough information to know if it's just because of the the representation of it or if it's the the difference in the distinct flavors. It's mm -hmm. a good question. I've got another. <laughs> <I'm over. laughs> um, as entrepreneurs, are there any like really exciting technologies that are coming out that you're like really jazzed about? And are there any technologies that you're like, this could be a threat to the very nature of entrepreneurship in terms of empowering individuals rather than like empowering, you know, larger corporate structures, et cetera? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's a great one. I mean, AI, it's great for entrepreneurs because you get to streamline and automate a lot of your systems, but it's also, it, it's tough. It's kind of that slippery slope on, you know, the, the bigger corporations definitely have the stronger technology and access to um, cutting edge tech. Um, but AI has kind of leveled that playing field a bit, but also it, it it's just moving so quickly that it is hard to keep up. Yeah. And I think along, along with that, that there, because there is so much information, sometimes it's hard to access that information because you almost need to be in it to know it. You don't know what you don't know. And so there's things that like, we're like, Hey, like we need to do this. We need to streamline this process. And sometimes it takes us having that conversation first before we even realize that there might be something out there that can help us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Paige, I've got one last, like, I think final question that would be good maybe to end on, but I'm wanting to know if there's any other questions from audience members in the in the in the room before I maybe ask my final okay I'm going to take that as a no <laughs> um I think there's you know an obvious answer to this but I'm also curious to hear beyond you know maybe the obvious answer how can we support your business how can we as consumers as community members as mothers as whatever um, help support local indigenous indigenous businesses and then even more so local indigenous economies um, in general. Oh, dang. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that cough, it's going around. That's a great question. Um, I, I would say I would start and then maybe Alita, if you could finish that opportunities like this and even the it, the structure of Celtic, it, it looks phenomenal because those are all things that, uh, I feel like we just had to, because we jumped into it, we wanted to start our business. We had to learn on the fly and just shoot from the hip and, and kind of, you know, get dirty. And we messed up a lot of things, but we also, it, we learned a lot from those mistakes and so if we would have had a um, better, if we would have been, um, had access to something like this, some of those challenges that we, we had to address, we probably would, we probably would have been more informed. So the, how to start a business, those administrative pieces are pretty difficult. It doesn't sound like it would be difficult, but they really are. And having a support group, um, having a uh, here other like-minded individuals that have ideas and that drive, you want to surround yourself with motivated people and and driven people because you feed off of that energy, you feed off of that those ideas. And so I think creating 
this space is phenomenal. Um, I love Evergreen, graduated from Evergreen, and it's it's always been um, a great resource for the community. And then just as us individual consumers being mindful of where does our money go? Where does our time go? Not only in terms of monetary um, pay, buying something, but also what are we um, consuming or highlighting on um, social media and those types of things? Are they small businesses? Uh, um, are they other local industries, that sort of thing? Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, I think along with that, too, is that a lot of times there are a lot of small businesses within each tribe, but they're not always marketed the correct way. Mm -hmm. And so we know that it's not a unique issue for mm -hmm. us in terms of marketing. Like this is more of like a, you know, a thing that happens in a lot of for a lot of native businesses is that they kind of fall short when it comes to marketing and putting themselves out there. And um, so I think, you know, when you see it, share it, tell your friends about you know these businesses um not just for us but mm -hmm. like for this yeah the broader community and um yeah having things like this or even like a resource list of like where can you shop and I, I think there's a website now called buy native mm -hmm. you know there's a resource on there that like it, it tags a lot of it links a lot of um native store owners and then understanding that you know because some of these items are handmade by people that there is going to be a higher value, but you're paying, the, the cost that you're paying is for people's time, material, and effort into it, and that these aren't just manufactured products that are coming off of a, a shipping line. And so I think, you know, being conscious of how we're spending our money, where we're investing that money um, is the best way to support Native businesses. Mm -hmm. So I see it's 150. I want to take this time to say thank you to Erica and Aleda for giving us your time, giving us your knowledge, telling your story. I wanted to invite people in this Zoom environment to show your appreciation, your thanks in the chat with emojis. You can unmute. Um, yeah, just thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.